Good morning and welcome to CSIS. I'm John Alterman, the Senior Vice President, Brzezinski Chair, and uh, Head of the Middle East Program. Uh, first, before we start a security announcement, we've never had a problem before. In the event there's a problem, I'm the responsible officer. We have exits on the side and the back of the room. We can go lots of places, so don't worry. Follow my direction. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Lisa Anderson to uh, present the third in our series of three talks uh, on the Middle East at an inflection point. This is an activity which is supported by the general funds to the Middle East program. And it just seemed to us as we were looking forward to a new administration five years after the beginning of the Arab uprisings, it would be useful to take stock of where we are. Uh, in my mind, there could be no better guide than our speaker today. Uh, I've known Lisa for 25 years, and she's always impressed me. She uh, just left as, from a five-year tenure as the president of the American University in Cairo, for, uh, which she also served as provost for two years. Uh, she was the dean of the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, the former head of the Middle East Institute at Columbia, the Shotwell Professor uh, of International Relations. Um, Lisa has not only had a distinguished career in administration, but as a political scientist, I think she has really had a remarkable record analyzing and describing in real terms what is happening and why things are happening in the Middle East uh, in an incredibly tumultuous five years in Egypt, she was there. And she was working with the various governments and working with students uh, in the midst of this all. So as we think about the Middle East at an inflection point, as I said, I can think of no better guide for the perplexed than Lisa Anderson. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. It is a delight to be here. I'm honored to be in the august company of the other speakers in this series, um, particular, particularly Ambassador Aloteba, who, as you may know, is a trustee of the American University in Cairo. Um, I have lots of things that I could talk about um, as they were doing my farewell parties at AUC. They remarked that probably uh, that it probably would not happen again that a president of AUC served under four different presidents of the republic, um, <laughs> and I think that's probably true. But what I want to do is really a much larger kind of big picture um, reflection on where the Middle East is today and. Um, how we really need to be thinking, I think, in somewhat new ways about the region itself and about the kinds of challenges that it presents uh, to us in the United States, to its own governments, to its own people. It's a very complicated time um, in the region, as you all undoubtedly know. Um, so I think it's important to take an opportunity like this to step back a little and reflect on what I actually think might be called multiple inflection points. So the title of this series, The Middle East is at an Inflection Point, I think um, speaks to an interesting moment, but it also suggests that we should be thinking that it's not a single thing that's changing. Whole sets of things are changing in history. Um, so let me start with a few general observations about what I describe as the historical arcs in which the region finds itself um, today, and then signal a little bit how they're reflected in the current fortunes of particular countries and conflicts. So I would argue that there are really three quite distinct historical revolutions of different scales that are converging in the events that began as the Arab Spring five or so years ago, um, which is part of the reason why both its timing and its fury were somewhat unexpected. Um, there were plenty of Jeremiahs around, including in this city, but there really wasn't anyone who anticipated quite the drama that would follow um, the departure of Ben Ali from Tunisia in the region. What first caught everyone's eye, and I think um, probably is what we understood the best, 
um, were what might be called straightforward uprisings against authoritarian governments and regimes. This was the original call for the ouster of Ben Ali in Tunisia. And in themselves, these changes, these um, developments, were not dynamically dissimilar from comparable revolts and political revolutions in other times and places. So we expected the process to look more or less like the fall of the military regimes in Latin America or the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. We were ready to look for various domestic actors, were there divisions within the regime, how hardline was the military, would civil society produce political parties to negotiate with regime reformists. All that kind of thing was what we thought was pretty familiar. And we added a few notes about the neighborhood effect and about great power involvement. We looked at, noticed that the United States was involved in Egypt and the Saudis in Bahrain and so forth. But it all seemed pretty much like garden variety regime change, something that the political scientists and the policymakers of this country were familiar. Even the mess in Libya was predictable and predicted. But somehow it went well beyond that. Um, and this is the, uh, the second of my three arcs of revolution. I would argue that global politics itself is inflecting. Um, and that was to raise the stakes and add an element of significant uncertainty to the dynamics within countries in the region. The apparent end of history, the end of the Cold War, and more importantly, the revolution in information and communications technologies about which we talk all the time, have brought largely unanticipated changes to the character and context of politics everywhere, including in this country. In the absence of a great power menace, that is to say the dynamic of the Cold War, that seemed to keep people rallied around their flags, and with the newfound access and expertise, particularly of young people, the world is seeing a surge of global populism, a growing skepticism about authority of all kinds, and enthusiasm for creative destruction, not unlike the political upheavals that attended the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. So we're in a world historical revolution um, of important magnitude. From the Occupy movements around the world, recall that millions of individuals mobilized in flash mobs of protest in Madrid, in New York, in Istanbul, in Santiago, in Kiev, and of course in Cairo and elsewhere in the Arab world. From that, which you will recall, all of that was part of this dynamic, to the popularity of outsiders as presidential candidates even in the United States, anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment politics is endemic. So you saw the intersection of very local complaints about very local governments and regimes with dynamics that were global dynamics of how protest happens and what kinds of um, modalities there are to protest. Um, so some of this, the global level, we foresaw, although probably not how quite tantalizing and terrifying it would be. Um, policymakers and analysts did anticipate that there were going to be major shifts in how the global political economy would take shape, um, but not exactly how that would happen. And I want to remind you of a passage that I often use as an example of how clever we all are, at least some of us, um, and yet how puzzling the implications of what our uh, insights may be. About 10 years ago, Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote, and I quote, nation states will not disappear, but they will share power with larger no a larger number of powerful non-sovereign actors than ever before, including corporations, NGOs, terrorist groups, drug cartels, regional and global institutions, banks, and private equity funds. Sovereignty, he went on, will fall victim to the powerful and accelerating flow of people, ideas, greenhouse gases, goods, dollars, drugs, <coughs> viruses, emails, and weapons within and across borders. The world 35 years from now will be semi-sovereign. It will reflect the need to adapt legal and political principles to a world in which the most serious challenges to order come from what global forces do to states and what governments do to their citizens rather than from what states do to each other. 10 years in, that sounds pretty right, actually, at least as you think about the Middle East. Um, and yet we hadn't, in, in that description, really thought very 
much about how exactly that would um, transpire, transpire in any particular place. And I think we see much of that playing out in the region. But even if we half expected this revolution at the global scale, and even if we at least half understood the revolution at the domestic scale, the uprisings against regimes, we're still working out its implications. And for the, our purposes in the Middle East, the dual revolutions of local regime change and global transformation converge in what I would describe as a third revolution between these scales, which is regional. Between the local and the global, a regional revolution, or perhaps two, is taking place before our very eyes. We are witnessing both, and this people have written about, um, but I think to put them together um, is important, the beginning of the end of the imperial era and the particular state system it left in the region, and an internal regional revolt, if you will, um, perhaps better a transfer of power, whether this turns out to be a revolt um, in any um, seismic way in the region, I think remains to be seen, but a transfer of power from the region's fading nationalist establishment um, and the governments of those countries to, the, to a sort of nouveau riche, um, the Gulf against Egypt, kings against generals, with all of the political and cultural implications that that entails. So these regional revolutions are larger than a change in regimes, smaller than a change in the global means and mode of production, but they shape how these other revolutions are reflected in the region itself and are, of course, shaped by them in turn. No wonder it seems so complicated. I think it's fair to say we now live in an era of quantum politics. Uncertainty is not a transitory condition, it is a principle. And I think that will be true forever now. The moment where we really thought we could understand with certainty the character of um, politics, particularly in the Middle East, but globally, is probably over. So the interplay of all these revolutions creates an enormous amount of complexity and confusion for us. Um, so what I simply want to do is tick off a few issues I think are necessary to construct a description of the region, anticipate what the trajectory of some of these different levels of revolution might be. I think, in fact, there are some patterns of at least winners and losers or shifts in the way politics happens that, are, that we can tease out of this very complicated landscape. In the first place, keep in mind that the state that we have described for now 10 or 20 years as in eclipse is itself a relatively new feature of human society, and there are a lot of alternatives to the state, and there historically have been. Other sorts of communities, families, tribes, churches, religious brotherhoods, business networks, secret societies, all sorts of things have served for millennia as vehicles for regulating social interaction, organizing economic production and exchange, assuring security. And in many parts of the Middle East where formal expressions of statehood, territorial boundaries, standing armies, international sovereignty are eroding as Haas anticipated, these kinds of communities are reviving. And while they may be partly reinventions of tradition, they are quite robust. And I'll be returning to them over the course of time. The state and the way the state was created in the Middle East and North Africa in itself contributed to the character of these kinds of non-state actors. There were two congenital defects, if you will, in the states as they were established, particularly after the First World War. They have an ambiguous, sometimes hostile, sometimes unhealthily codependent on relations with non-state communities and identities. I'll elaborate on that. And they have responsibilities they could never fulfill with, on their own resources. So let me talk a little bit about that because I think it's important to recognize the, the um, the way the states and non-state identities and actors have been intertwined since the very beginning of the modern state era in the Middle East and North Africa about 100 years ago. 
And I'll start you, start you off by reminding you of a little bit of the language of the terms of the Covenant of the League of Nations, which established the mandates in um, former Ottoman territories. It says there are, quote, certain communities, that their term, that belong to the former Ottoman Empire that had reached a stage of development, I'm quoting, where their existence as independent nations can be provisionally recognized subject to the mandates. And in Article 22, the League promised there should be applied the principle that the well-being and development of such peoples form a sacred trust of civilization. Okay, so the language suggests that communities will be recognized as nations, presumably to be accorded corresponding states, when actually, of course, what really mattered in the creation of these entities was imperial convenience and political patronage. In other words, to the Maronites, to the Zionists, to the Hashemites, to the House of Saud, to the Trucial state rulers, to the junior partner in the First World War, Italy, and then to the Sanusia in Libya, and so forth and so on. These were not communities that were designed to be nations and accorded states. So from the very beginning of European tutelage, state identities were entangled with family, patronage, identity-based communities and networks. And that's been true, and everyone in this room is undoubtedly aware of that. Except in the very established states, most of which predate this period, Iran, Egypt, Turkey. Turkey, by the way, got 80% of the bureaucrats of the Ottoman imperial administration. Hence, its state was instantaneously very strong, well-equipped, well-trained um, in the 1920s, and most of the former Ottoman provinces in the Arab world were denuded of their bureaucratic capacity. Iran, Turkey, Egypt, Tunisia, to some extent, had formal institutions of bureaucratic states. Um, but apart from them, those institutions are always a bit of a fig leaf and fiction. Or as the US ambassador said of the government of independent Libya in 1951, it was a last resort, an expedient, and an experiment. It was not obviously something that he had a lot of confidence in succeeding. The alienation from and hostility to the modern states of the Middle East was occasionally expressed in support for violent political movements. Um, against governments and their supporters, usually when sectarianism was politicized, but not that often, or certainly not as often as is the case today. But what, it, what happened was that it was routinely exhibited in what looks from the bureaucratic state's perspective like corruption. That is, reliance on friends, family, ethnic and religious ties, money changers, even criminal networks to obtain the necessities of daily life. And these, of course, these networks ate away at efforts to create the formal institutions of a modern state. So you had the, the scaffolding of a modern state, but most of the ways that scaffolding was deployed was for the purposes of other kinds of networks and identities. The second congenital defect was the proposition that the well-being and development of peoples form a sacred trust of civilization. That including what I just called the necessities of modern life, um, as an obligation on the part of these um, states, may not seem like a bad thing. But the introduction of the standards of a modern welfare state responsible for well-being and development in countries which had not developed the economic base, extractive capacity, or fiscal apparatus to pay for it was to me that most of them remained at the mercy of external patrons hardly the hallmark of robust sovereignty. So both from the inside and the outside, these states were as much the appearance as the reality, debilitated from the start, expected to meet domestic policy standards that were barely possible even in the most economically developed and well-administered states, while bereft of all but the most minimal economic assets and elementary institutions. And it was unclear what constituents they were supposed to serve. So they weren't very robust to begin with, as you can obviously tell. And they, over the course of time, they failed to meet the standards they set for themselves. They never thrived, never. And they slowly, and in the beginning, imperceptibly began to fail. We now talk a lot about failed states. But failed states don't usually fail instantaneously. They fail over time. And what you saw was states that were being hollowed out 
They were failing before it was apparent. But a compensatory world developed. It wasn't, you don't have failed states and then atomized shards on the landscape. Today, I'll give you an example of in, what a, in, in the country that has one of the strongest states actually in the region, Egypt, well over half the commercial transactions are unrecorded. 7% of adult Egyptians have a bank account. And this is not for want of access. Mobile phone penetration in Egypt is 115%. So there are more mobile phones than are people. But the same people who have mobile phones, smartphones, and so forth, don't put their money in banks. So even in a country which, as I say, has a fairly robust state capacity, this is not a country that is managing its own fiscal apparatus, is managing its own monetary policy. None of that is taking place in any sophisticated way. After decades of, quote, fiscal reform, non-tax revenue in Egypt is 10% of GDP, a figure that Christine Lagarde of the IMF described delicately last fall as very low for a modern economy like Egypt's. So in essence, you have a layer of the appearance of a modern economy like Egypt's, and below that, or beside it, or around it, is a different economy. And as I say, Egypt is a fairly robust state. If it has virtually no reliable data on the ac ec economic activity of its population, we can hardly expect its counterparts elsewhere in the region to know more than the Egyptians know about their own populations. The informal world in the Middle East is often called the dark sector or the black market or the gray economy, but it's actually quite variegated and colorful. Their personal associations of extended families, co-religionists, re regional and ethnic networks, friends and associates move money around and other goods and services in a constant churn of activity. Ideas move, money move, moves, people move, um, form, reform, constantly. Informal savings associations like uh, Egypt's credit unions permit small investors to access credit through networks of friends and family. And sometimes when people talk about the informal economy of any place, but in this region particularly, they behave as if it's only for people who are relatively poor. These credit unions have senior vice presidents of the American University in Cairo operating in them. They're not for poor people, they're for everyone, and particularly people who are not reliant on the formal banking system. Illegal and quasi-legal housing communities and settlements circle all of the major cities of the Arab world. Some of them are quite posh. This is not simply the informal slums of the big cities, but the gated communities that are developing all around Cairo, for example. I think it's fair to call them quasi-legal. Healthcare, childcare, legal assistance, job leads are all bartered and exchanged among networks of family and friend and neighbor, often cemented by ties of ethnic affiliation or religious conviction. And again, if that's happening in Egypt, it's been happening everywhere as well. As the Lebanese sociologist Hassan Salama put it some years ago, gangs, nepotistic privatizations, trafficking and influence, tolerance of drugs, militia corruption, the so-called black or informal economy, and parastatist rackets have all been obstacles to democratization, says he. But to remain at this level of ethical condemnation is inadequate precisely because these gangs are also the instrument of survival of groups marginalized by the state as well as forces maintaining those states. So to, and I will return to this. I think the condemnation, the description of this kind of activity is corruption and therefore not you know, rising to a level that we can actually address systematically has um, been part of our analytical and therefore policy failure. The failure of the states of the region produced and sustained non-state actors all over the place not simply as political and military challenges to the states, but in the daily lives of nearly everyone who lives there. This is important, what General Mattis, who was also a speaker in this series, has called a franchising transnational non-state terrorist group, ISIS, is operating in a sea of franchising transnational non-state actors of a whole variety of kinds, many of which seem quite benign and are well regarded by their beneficiaries. So how do you make those kinds of distinctions in a way that 
resonates in the region as opposed to just seems about violence. And that's an important element, but clearly not the only one. I think this, the importance of this, these kinds of non-state actors, some of which, as I say, are quite benign and well-regarded, is visible in the second element of the regional revolution. So I've talked about the, the effort to create you know, recognizable states. I've talked about the fact that those states virtually from the beginning were designed to fail and that they did in most places. I think there's also something else that is going on in the region that I think is important. Um, the advantage that the monarchs of the Gulf, Jordan, and Morocco enjoy in a world like this. They make no claim to operate any other way. Dynastic rule, which is so tested by the formal impersonal rules of the modern state, is entirely consistent with, in both principle and practice, the operation of these kinds of informal networks of personal and particularistic ties. That the, these regimes, particularly the GCC regimes, have adroitly managed the oil revenues of which so many are beneficiaries to strengthen their clientels within their own countries and across the region has, of course, contributed to and perhaps accelerated the erosion of the Republican states and the nationalist, secularist, and populist ideologies they espoused. But it's also permitted them to operate in a way that is consistent with the lived experience of many of the people in the region. The Egyptian blogger Mahmoud Salem, who writes as Sand Monkey, wrote a piece several years ago about Egypt being trapped in the 1980s. It's a lovely piece, exceptionally perceptive, about how Egyptians sort of stopped paying attention once they got to about 1985 and they thought that they were the most modern country in the region. But what it does not do is discuss how, at just at the moment when Egypt became complacent, the Gulf took off and quickly overtook Egypt and as the area within the region of cosmopolitan prosperity and innovation. Not only did the Egyptians not notice, but frankly, I think a lot of people didn't notice that, both within the region and beyond. But the initiative in the Arab world has clearly moved east from Egypt, at least for the foreseeable future. And as it did, the authority of the impersonal state in regional politics was further weakened. Now, by 2011, popular disillusionment and cynicism was expressed in outright opposition to the policies and then the governments and then the regimes and in some places the states of the region. The flash mobs of protest we saw all over the world solidified into guerrilla forces and militias in this part of the region, supported by these kinds of transnational networks of money and sentiment. In working those networks and challenging the legitimacy of the putative states, they have challenged notions of crime and corruption. The rulers are the criminals, the states are corrupt, are natural communities of friends and co-religionists and so forth are in fact the uncorrupt, the moral, the way we ought to be behaving. So today there are many challengers and few defenders of the formal impersonal welfare states that fail to deliver on their promises, nor the state system that stabilized them in the region. Outside powers, including the United States, are understandably puzzled about how to contribute to shaping an alternative system. What are the alternatives? In the first place, I think we need to think about how much we want to invest in the state as an institution and the particular states in the region. This is an existential reflection on what Richard Haas projected. If states are not going to be the powerful mechanism by which we organize global politics and economics, what is, and should we be trying at the end of the era of the state to shore up states. <clears throat> Again, I think there are strong bureaucracies, Israel, Turkey, Iran, Egypt, Tunisia, but these, are inst these institutions are themselves becoming increasingly the tools of particularistic purposes um, and not serving the sort of formal as the sort of formal impersonal apparatus that can effectively collect taxes, distribute goods, and provide services equitably among citizens. Iran is already deeply sectarian. The ethnic and religious coloration of Turkey's state is becoming more and more apparent. In Egypt, competing networks of power 
Saudi-supported Salafis, Qatari-supported brother, Muslim brothers, a US-supported military industrial complex has been jockeying for supremacy. Even in Israel, the attachment to mid-20th century norms of secular citizenship is giving away to open expressions of religious and ethnic bias. So clearly, even in the strong states, the question of whether these are going to be serving the citizens as opposed to some ethnic, religious, familiar purposes is an open one. Elsewhere, in the vacuums of completely, almost completely failed states, alternatives proliferate unbidden. That we have an impoverished vocabulary to capture and describe these alternatives, and indeed that we have spent the last century or so condemning them as corrupt, does not make them any less powerful. As Salema suggests, we need a way to talk about these particularistic identities and patronage communities that go beyond, goes beyond condemnation and revulsion, not necessarily to endorse them, but to understand how they work. The black market and the gray economy of the region cannot remain opaque to us if we are actually to play a productive role in improving human life in the Middle East. So if I were to give one piece of advice to the next president of any country, including this one, Follow the money. Get the numbers and insist on the data. Find out where things are going. As is repeatedly observed about this part of the world, the data on numbers of people, financial transactions, anything that has a number attached to it is terrible. And that's not coincidental. It's because there are essentially two worlds operating here. But the formal world, the formal economy, the formal numbers, what these governments supply to the World Bank and the IMF and so forth and so on, is a small proportion of what's actually going on. And if we really under want to understand how people are living their lives, we need to know much more about the rest of the economy, what's below the waterline. So unless we're better at doing that, and our own track record, the American track record in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria is scandalous on this score. Physician, heal thyself. So we have to do better on our own terms, but we also have to know much better where the military budget of these countries is going, where the, what the remittances are buying, who's funding the gangs, the real estate developers, the sheikhs, the TV networks, who's buying the guns and the drugs and the tickets and the villas and the political leaders. Unless we know better a lot of that, we will never understand the politics. And we should, not, we should not know more about Iran's nuclear program than about Egypt's military budget. So certain of these kinds of things are just matters of information. The US will have to work with the governments of the established states, Tunisia and Egypt, easily the strongest states in the Arab world, Turkey, Iran, and Israel where struggles over the uses of the state apparatus continue. In the Gulf, the skillful outsourcing of state functions from military to economic policy making and education and health care has permitted reliance on family and sect to grow and indeed flourish. These governments may be showing us a future in which the bundle of responsibilities associated with modern states, the welfare and development of the people, can be fulfilled in novel ways. Maybe you can outsource a lot of the welfare state. But because there's little difference between the public treasury and the privy purse in dynastic regimes, the call for transparency is both more essential and more difficult. Privatization is a way of moving things out of the public sector and out of the glare of publicity. So too, a public sphere in which citizens debate policy is difficult to outsource. And the importance of a realm of open and unfettered debate should not be discounted. So I think those are the kinds of things that within the region, anyone, any outside power, any internal government will need to be grappling. The apparent paralysis of the great powers, or what used to be called the great powers, notably the one we are, sit we are sitting in, but also Europe and in many ways even Russia, is partly a reflection of the complexity of the challenges. But it also reflects the impact of the global revolution that I was talking about globally. The anti-establishment streak that is shaping politics everywhere from Athens to Madrid to Brussels and London and Washington is distracting attention and sapping the confidence of foreign policy establishments everywhere. 
governments are either beleaguered by political uprisings or themselves of an insurgent frame of mind. See the president of Russia and at least one of the political parties here. Sober, modest assessments of national values, vital interests, and national cap capabilities are disappointing in that context, while inflammatory claims and fear-mongering will produce unworkable and dangerous policy. Looking over the region the last time, and these are, this is my final comment, the last time that globalization was imploding into war about 100 years ago suggests some salutary lessons, not least that outsiders risk getting tangled in local feuds and in, vet, in vet, vendettas in which they will never be more than tools. This time, however, there seems to be little appetite for taking on the responsibilities of, quote, rendering administrative advice and assistance on the part of the civilized world, nor, probably more importantly, even a clear consensus about what exactly is civilized. It is indeed a world at an inflection point. Thank you. Why don't you sit and we'll, we'll have a little conversation and then we'll open it up. Thank you very much for those very thoughtful and thought-provoking remarks. I think the, the first question that, that strikes me is that this shift the Gulf states made to sort of modernizing but keeping personal politics um, it was facilitated by spectacular wealth. What does the advent of scarcity in the Middle East with much lower oil prices, probably certainly much lower for the next 10 years than they were for the last 10, what does the rise of scarcity mean for uh, the ability to keep the personalization because of a sense that the great thing about bureaucratic politics is they're efficient? or they should be more efficient than personalized. It doesn't have all the extras given to loyalists. Does, does scarcity change this game? Does scarcity just make the game more vicious? How should we think about scarcity in terms of this, this model to the, about the, 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 the rise of personal politics? Well, I actually, uh, I think there are two things. First of all, um, our sense of bureaucracy making things more efficient is uh, not the lived experience of most of us, actually. Um, anybody who's had to renew their driver's license um, doesn't feel like bureaucracy makes things more efficient anywhere in the world. So I think the lived experience of bureaucracy, yes, um, Weber was right. You can do a great deal more with a bureaucratic organization. But there are even limits to that. Secondly, part of my concern is when you think about the region and you think about scarcity, you're thinking about what's above the waterline. You're thinking about what you can see. I am not persuaded yet that we are really entering that kind of. So if you, you know, Egypt is a country where scarcity is the watchword, um, and it's been on the verge of collapse since 2011. And, you know, every quarter everyone says it's run out of everything. It, it doesn't live that way. It doesn't, the, the experience of being able to, you know, continue the staggering building that's going on in the suburbs of Cairo and so forth and so on, it doesn't stop. So I'm not sure that we fully understand how the formal economy is connected to the informal economy. So presumably the element that is the formal economy of, you know, or distribution of oil revenues will be reshaped. But since so much of that is siphoned into an, in, has always been siphoned into an informal economy whose traces we really don't follow very effectively, I'm not sure that it's going to feel as scarce as it's going to look on paper, and, on the one hand. And secondly, I have no idea how actually the choices will be made when they're, should they have to be made, that I'm going to have to cut out some of my clients because I can't afford it. Um, so I'm, I'm simply not as convinced that as, you know, people always say, well, once you have fiscal austerity, then you're going to have to straighten up and fly right, and you can't waste a lot of money and so forth. I'm just not convinced that we're confronting that. Um, and one of the 
things that, that you feel is also happening is, is the, the, the decline of the state after a century of the, not only the rise of the state, but also the, the spectacular relevance of modern states where they hadn't existed before is, you know, the only borders that have changed in the Middle East in the last hundred years have been Israel-Palestine and the two Yemens united. Well, now the Saudis have got, gotten their two islands back from Egypt. They never <laughs> lost them. Um, these states have proven remarkably not only durable, but there's no near-peer competitor even with the rise of all these other institutions. And from the perspective of the United States government, the European Union, China, they only have gears to interface with other governments. Mm. There's something about the external environment which seeks states to interface with. Right. Does that create a lifeline for the state? Does it mean that all the states just decline together and non-state actors across the world become more powerful? Or is there something where non-state actors in the Middle East are already on the weak side? Does this give the states a, a new lease on life? No, I actually, I think you're right that, that as with Sub-Saharan Africa, there was in essence an agreement saying, since it would be such a catastrophe if we really fought over all of our borders, we're not gonna fight over our borders. And moreover, it is easier for the rest of the world to you know, have an interlocutor that it recognizes, and that's the presidential palace of a country and a member of the United Nations. And so there's a kind of international consensus that this is the way we're going to operate. But the difficulty with that is that it stays at this level of appearances, if you will. And most of these countries, and I would argue that this is not unique to the Middle East, if you actually look at much of Sub-Saharan Africa, you have something of the same sort of patterns, that, that they are sitting on the top of societies that are very loosely linked to that system. So either the parts of the world, Europe, the United States, so forth, that it, are much more invested in the state system, figure out a way to force that connection of the states and their populations in the region and elsewhere. Or more likely, even in the countries that were the origin of the international state system, that will begin, and this is Haas's argument, I mean basically it doesn't matter what we want to do, corporations are going to be more important, international NGOs are going to be more important, everything's going to be more important. And the state system is going to be only one of the many ways in which we interact with each other. But you're quite right, we have very limited mechanisms for interactions at other of those scales. The state system, international law, the United Nations, so forth and so on, we understand how that works. We understand how you give foreign aid from one country to another country and how a, you know, the military regimes ought to intersect with each other and so forth. We actually, as we struggle even now with this business about you know, corporations moving their headquarters to avoid taxes and so forth and so on, it's, it's slipping out from under control even in the parts of the world in which you would expect there would be a fairly strong capacity to monitor and control and so forth. So I don't know that there's going to be a great, and this is what I was suggesting before. I mean, this is part of the real puzzle. This is not an easy time to try and figure out how to make policy in general. But to say, well, we should shore up the states in the region at a time when at the other end of the spectrum, they're beginning to shred doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. On the other hand, since you don't know what a stable equilibrium will be, you're you know, either confronted with saying, well, we're going to deal with non-state actors even though we don't really know how to do that, or we're going to continue to deal with states because it's the only thing we know what to do. You know, so this is the, the tool I have. So I have a hammer. Everything has to be nails. Right. It sounds from your presentation like you think the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is a nice idea, but probably not well tuned to the world in which we live. Is that, is that an accurate yeah. extension of the argument? Yeah. I so think we should so. just, that, that shouldn't be where we're focusing energy. Well, I do think that, that you know, 
it is a complicated uh, challenge to be thinking about what we want our own domestic rule of law to look like and acknowledge that there, is a, there are whole worlds in which that's, you know, that's not going to, just not the lens through which people look at things. So I do think that, you know, the issue, I mean, there is a growing smallish political science literature now on the growth of patrimonial um, standards even in the United States, that you, know, you now have many more of the wealthiest people in this country or families in a way that wasn't true 50 years ago, so forth and so on. So it may be even here you're beginning to see different standards and different criteria for how people are permitted to operate that, you know, um, I think the, the, I would be reluctant to say we're abandoning our own legal standards simply because it would be easier if we did because that's always the rationale for abandoning legal standards. On the other hand, I think we, we do need to be alert to the fact that these kinds of standards for how we interact with each other in this country and beyond are changing. So whereas 50 or 60 years ago, nepotism was something that we simply thought was unacceptable in the United States, that's no longer as unacceptable as it once was. And in terms of how we approach the world, I mean, we approach the world first as missionaries. Right. Uh, we have been investing in civil society around the world. Should we stop? Should we do it in different ways? Should we be more targeted? How should we think about the, the, the project in investing in societies that work more, not only like us, but more the way we think we should ourselves work, even if we're not working that way all the time? Well, I do. I mean, I think you put your finger on a challenge that is a, f a reflection of the fact of how little we know. So, as I was saying, we don't have data. We don't have, you know. So we go in and we'll say, I mean, it was everybody who went into Libya the first couple of years after Gaddafi fell, and were incredibly optimistic about they were going to create these little civil society organizations and then so forth and so on. Um, we're simply taking, you know, the, the instruction manual for something that would have happened in New York and take it to Tripoli. And they weren't really listening or attending to how people in Libya have become accustomed to living, which doesn't mean the people in Libya want to continue to live that way, but it's where they're starting. They're not starting where you start on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. They're starting from a different lived experience. So to take the instruction manual without listening was a mistake. So I think we need to know more about how people live. And some of that is simply listening, and some of it is collecting better data and knowing more about how money moves around and the kinds of things I was talking about before. But I do think that if you go and say, and, and honestly, it was something that many people remarked on during the, um, the period of elections after the beginning of the Arab Spring, the extent to which people came with just, you know, instruction manuals of how to run elections and so forth and so on, that they seemed to believe would work anywhere. And that's what I mean. They sort of thought, oh, we know Latin America, we know Eastern Europe, we know what happened. And there was a, a very, very well-known political scientist who will remain nameless, who came to Egypt, had never been to Egypt before. I won't name him either. <laughs> and gave us a list of 18 points to give to the uh, government of Egypt so that the transition would work well. So, so, so there, but there are two issues. One is doing it the right way. And the other is whether we should be doing it at all. Should we be trying to move countries toward having a model that we see more compatible? Should we be investing in it? Uh, when we differ with governments, should that color our relations? I mean, this comes up not only in Egypt, but, but around the region. Right. right. Well, I, I do think that there's a, you know, so, so on the one hand, you're talking about government to government relations in the expectation that these governments are in some way in control of the states that they're putative governments of. 
Um, and I do think that that's a level at which, until there are other kinds of non-state institutions that we recognize and understand, we're going to have to be operating at. Um, but I think that can be fairly modest and fairly restrained. That's a you know that's the level at which you can operate as you know if you will national interest level. There are lots of other things that happen in the region, including if. I can put it this way, university relationships and connections and so forth and so on that don't, ha that don't have to be driven by national interests, don't have to be understood in terms of national interests, but if you're so inclined, can certainly contribute to the well-being of people. So my view is that it doesn't all have to be, I mean, I don't think you have to say, okay, we're going to be isolationists and we don't really care because we think it's beyond our writ to be concerned about the well-being of anybody. I think you can say there are other levels of interactions of peoples, which again, so it's a little like Pandora's box. If you look at the list of things that Richard Haas said were going to be all released, then a little bit of hope has to be released as well. So that kind of thing of being able to say, yes, I think education, other things being equal is a good idea. Um, certain kinds of skills are a good idea, so forth. That should just be going. It doesn't need... Um, you know, so that can be driven by businesses that want to incubate small businesses. That can be driven by various kinds of investments. That can be driven by you know acquisitions of French. I don't care how you do that. That doesn't need to be at the official level. So the official level could be fairly modest in saying we only deal on things that are of national interest. But we also understand that globalization is going to bring a whole lot of other kinds of relationships. We want to keep people safe, but beyond that, it's up to them. And when governments say, don't talk to these people, should we? Ignore them. Ignore them. OK. I turn it over to you. Uh, we have a microphone, so if you please wait for a microphone, identify yourself. Uh, ask just one question until we have a chance. I see all the way in the back. Uh, that's you. Thank you. Hi, Bill Zarvin from SAIS. Thank you, Lisa. Welcome here. Um, I, I think everybody has their th a list of three revolutionary elements, and I, your first two, I think, were very uh, uh, pertinent. I was uh, surprised on the third that you didn't mention anything about transnational uh, religious zealotry as a, a new uh, or a striking phenomenon of this era. Um, and in fact, you went back to talk about states in, instead. Do you think that's uh, less important or not particularly striking at this time? I think I, well, no, I think when I say that there are these networks of relationships that are not state, that are non-state actors, include religious groups, include family networks, include all sorts of communities with which we can affiliate ourselves. Um, and so I intended to encompass that as well. I don't know that I think that this is entirely new. Um, as somebody who studied, for example, the San Lucia in the 19th century, large transnational religious groups were all over the region for, you know, centuries and centuries. How they, are, how they interact, given the fact that there's more money sloshing around than there was in the 19th century Sahara, and given the fact that they are also having to intersect with states, which are presumably trying to inhibit or enhance their capacity to be transnational, that's new. But the impulse to be transnational is not new. Gentleman there, right? Hi, uh, Dave Ottaway from the Wilson Center. Um, I'm wondering whether we should rethink promoting democracy. Uh, and I'm thinking, I mean, Iraq's a perfect example. Political parties, when you, in democracy, you've got to have political parties. Political parties in the Middle East, you know, look at Iraq. They're all Shiite, Sunni, Kurdish, you name it. In fact, democracy revives uh, these very traditional forces you're talking about. And so my question is, has democracy promotion actually been part of the problem and we should stop doing it. Hmm. I don't know if it's been part of the problem. I think it's been ineffective. Um, and I think after a certain point, you should stop doing things that don't work. 
Um, what I would regret, however, is encompassing in abandoning democracy promotion, which I, as I say, I don't think it's worked, so I don't think there's much value in continuing to do it. Um, but what I would be sorry to see is um, saying we actually don't care about people's well-being. But well-being, you know, accountable government, um, access to certain kinds of services, access to education and information and so forth and so on. I think what we really need to be doing is paying less attention to the formal institutions and more attention to the substance that they're supposed to serve. And if those particular substantive ends can be served in a variety of ways, that's what we really care about. At least it's, that's what I would really care about. Lady right there. Yep. Um, thanks so much for the very interesting presentation. Um, Alison McManus from the Tahir Institute for Middle East Policy. Um, I think your point's very well taken about the recession of, of states in the global era. Um, however, I guess I'm thinking about laws and legal institutions as still being very much state-based, and, and particularly really law enforcement. Um, the case of Egypt, you know, if we're talking about these transnational global networks, um, maybe not listening to the state and rather supporting civil society, for instance, directly. Well, as we know right now, there are you know, civil societies sort of criminalized as it works with um, foreign entities. So how do we think about these transnational global networks, I guess, um, while law is still state-based? An excellent way of framing the problem, actually, because I don't think, you know, over the course of your lifetime, probably, you will see um, legal reform in order to accommodate the mobility of everything. Ideas, people, money, all the things that Haas and everybody talks about. Right now, we're not there. We're not there in very simple terms, in, in commercial terms, now, much less these other kinds of ideas. So um, you're right. We're, we're caught at a moment where we know that there has to be some kind of legal regime for um, access to information globally. There's going to have to be. You can't do that state by state. It doesn't make any sense. At the same time, there is no such regime. And what efforts there are at this point are certainly not well integrated and accepted and so forth. So you do run into the problem of saying, so this is the problem of if the government says you shouldn't talk to them, you do anyway, and then you're going to get in trouble because that's the legal regime you're living in. So I understand that. I still think um, that it makes sense to try and be thinking about this in a way that does acknowledge that there are these kinds of relationships and networks and so forth, that there are you know, conceivably ways to put your thumb on the scale of supporting people's um, aspirations which aren't necessarily um, the sort of cliched democracy promotion and so forth. Um, and, and, you know, I, it, but you're right. It's a, it's a particularly challenging moment to figure out how to do that. And I think you see that all over the world. This is, again, this is not, you know, we care about the Middle East, but you see it all over the world, kind of how to support um, some of the protest movements in other parts of the world in a way that's effective. Um, has proven to be a challenge. Yeah, uh, Marina Ottawa Wilson Center. Um, one, there is no doubt that the, the number of failed, a very large number of states failed uh, since the 90s. We have Yugoslavia, we have the Soviet Union itself, but the result of all this, of these state failures, is that state, the number of states have multiplied. It's not that states have become less important. It's just that we have different states come to the surface. And this is what's happening in the, uh, uh, in the Middle East now, in the Levant. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think ISIS 
is going to last as a territorial state. But I think probably we are going to have not one, but two Kurdish states that are probably not going to disappear. So what I'm getting at is that we do not seem to be capable at this point to go beyond the concept of the state as a way of organizing human societies, essentially. In other words, all these organizations that you talk about do exist, but we still seem to hang on co collectively to this concept of the state. You care to, uh, you know, to react to that? Well, I think in a way, yes, of course. Um, but the expectation, so at the global level, if you look at this as, you know, as an international relations exercise, yes, of course, states are the coin. I mean, there isn't any other way that, you know, there's a little bit of the international financial institutions, there's a little bit of the world trade or, you know, and so forth. But basically, it's state-based interactions. Um, so if you have a piece of territory, somebody has to have planted a flag. There's no other way that we can think about it. And that will presumably obtain for some time. And in territorial terms, it may be that somebody has to be assigned responsibility for a given territory forever at this point. That's not the same thing as saying that the way these entities operate internally is recognizable from the perspective of the people who established an international community of states in the United Nations. So if you look at Central Asia, yes, of course, there are the Central Asian republics and they are members of the United Nations and so forth, but the way they're operating internally is not the way the Soviet Union operated. It's, they're not small versions of the Soviet state. They are patrimonial systems. They operate very much more like the non-state actors that I was talking about. They just happen to have captured a state. So some of our non-state actors are non-state actors. Some of them are non-state actors that are operating officially as the representatives of states. That's perfectly fine, and, but that's not the same. So, so I think what we need is a vocabulary and a conceptual apparatus to say that there is a state, it can operate as a European-style bureaucratic state with a rule of law and so forth and so on. And then we have these states that are actually ca captured by non-state actors, but because of the language we use, that almost doesn't make any sense. We're back to tribes with flags. We're back to tribes with flags. All right. Um, on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to, to cut things off. I want to thank President Anderson for her presentation. Thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon.